Since trading in the real market up until now has led to tiny profits that no one could complain about, there was only so much that could be earned by winning the investment contest from Nagana's point of view. Currently, including funds entrusted to us, my own capital, and the amount I was going to give to Hagana, the total amount had swelled to 600,000 moles. In other words, a 10% increase would be 60,000 moles in profit, and 20% of that would end up being 12,000 moles for myself. Hagana's share of 20% would come out to 2,400 moles. And even if we did poorly, a 10% profit was doable in a day. The general outlook on my assets put me at 180,000 moles. I started out with 70,000 moles and made a profit of 110,000 moles. 20% of that was Hagana's share, so at present, Hagana's compensation was above 30,000 moles. In other words, Hagana was only 20,000 moles away from being able to completely pay off Lisa's loan. At the current pace of 3 to 4,000 moles in profit each day, quick and dirty may answer that it wouldn't even take 10 days to accomplish the goal. On top of that, in terms of actual trading, we weren't the only ones who profited. She could greatly help Chris, who had no, help, no hope of getting into a university because she had no money despite having a gifted intellect, as well as the residents of the outer section struggling with debt. It was natural to think that Agana was more focused on that than the investment contest itself. It was completely rational. With the investment contest, no matter how well you did, the prize money was 200,000 moles. After paying off Lisa's 50,000 moles, split the difference. Naturally, that was no small amount of money, but real-world trading had no restrictions on how many days you could trade. If you spent more time at it, then the time that spent, the time spent would lead to greater profits and an increase in the number of people who could be helped. Nevertheless, Hagana complied with my wishes and focused on the contest. She didn't even ask for reasons. She didn't even know that I intended to give the 200,000 little prize money entirely to her. Naturally, I didn't mention that after the contest ended in the near future, I would cut ties with Hagana and work with Barton. Without knowing, and without wanting to know, Hagana had offered to help me. Though I wonder if she knew that I was hiding something from her, it was possible that she wasn't the type to think about such things. Overdeveloped those skills in mathematics and everything else falls on the wayside, as Barton said it. I have believed those words, and I also believed in something entirely different. Decided that we'd focus on the investment contest, we had really stayed focused. That day was supposed to be a day off, but we quickly got to trading in the living room and achieved a virtual 2 million moles in profit. Hagana's program is a powerful weapon, making it feel like taking a test while knowing all the answers, and thus it made trading successful. It did scare me that someday a program might make me obsolete. However, in pursuing a goal, this was a more reassuring tool than anything out there facing the challenge and pushing forward. Besides, recently Hagana had become concerned about my physical well-being and seemed to have a lot of questions to ask. Whether training was over or not, I was inundated with questions. I was surprised that she wanted to know so much, but I wondered whether or not I could beat whether or not I could beat that much zeal. Even as the day waned without realizing it, Hagana and I would look into our computers and have discussions in a completely dark living room. We came back to her senses only when Lisa returned from the Lunar Chinese restaurant and turned the lights on in the living room. Lisa was honestly pleased that it was better again. But what really bothered me most was when Lisa turned to Hagana and said, Good for you too, to her. Hagana was as surprised as I was, and she looked between me and Lisa repeatedly. Then I saw that her face was red. She looked down and nodded. This was the other half of the reason Hagana offered to listen to my request. More than I imagined, Hagana had forgiven me. By nature, she was very sincere. She knew that Lisa could see that she was overdoing it a bit. It's not far-fetched to say that this was thanks for helping Hagana make use of her mathematical abilities in a real-world setting. If I could see that to Hagana, this was a simple matter of thanks. Even that day, as if a bath would be a waste of time, she would drag on discussions with me, fiddling with the numerical output of her program until Lisa finally got mad and forced her to go. Not even five minutes would elapse before she'd come right back out. This time, she made sure to put on her pajamas, but she didn't take the time to dry her wet hair. Lisa stopped taking any chance and would proceed to wipe Agana's hair with a bath towel, then finished by wrapping it around her hair. The table in the room was lined up with work materials, and I could see the nape of Agana's neck with her hair bundled up like that. The strands of her hair and her white slender neck made her look like a really beautiful and mature woman. 
Late at night, after Lisa's growing impatience forced me to return to my room, I mailed Barton. Due to various circumstances, please wait until the end of the investment contest for a response, I wrote. Barton's response came immediately, and the contest said, not a problem. Despite Barton being a wealthy man who went in and out of the Grand Central Hotel and calmly rode around in a high-class limousine, he didn't seem to exhibit any arrogance or domineering nature. He was a man with a big heart who dealt with me as an individual. I had an inkling more or less how exhausting he was working in Schroeder Street based on rumors on the net and books. Not even being treated as a human being and having barely any time to sleep, there were only a small number of people with high-paying salaries, and a whole lot of them were often fired after one or two years. In return, when they hit it big, the returns were passive. However, there were ways to bypass the common route, where you gathered up capital and at your own discretion invested in a fund and managed it. One could work solo and still amass a fortune. That reason was why it was normal practice for people to join a major financial institution on Schroeder Street. It was to build up knowledge and then go solo afterwards. That was why there was probably no more fortuitous situation than training under Barton's wing. If you look up the Britannica on the net, it was number 32 on the list of 5,000 top investment funds in the world by percentage return. The total assets under management were 30 billion rules, while Barton's annual salary was 100 million rules. If I were to train under Barton and then study more beyond that after going solo, I could earn more than Barton, and possibly surpass him as well. The number one fund manager made 2 billion rules a year. In just a few years' time, the amount of money made wouldn't be any different from the budget for a small country. So even though he's not actually a fund manager, that should be around what Warren Buffett made off Berkshire Hathaway. The thing is, he gets his money through capital gains, so that's taxed at half the rate than actual income is in the U.S. So yeah, I'll spare you guys the tax chatter. In just a few years' time, the amount of money made wouldn't be any different from the budget for a small country. By that time, I would have many connections and anything would be possible. A dream. A dream about coming upon the undiscovered country. For that dream, I must cut ties with Agana. On the other hand, without me around, Agana's investment program would lose momentum and cease being able to earn her money. I couldn't pick both. That was why it was necessary to acquire the 200,000 mole prize money in the investment contest. morning. We ran into each other by chance after waking up in the morning. Agana was the first to issue a clear greeting. Uh, I replied as we both went into the living room. In the living room, Lisa had prepared breakfast. When she saw Agana and me come in at the same time, she smiled gently. Today there are 72 stocks. Volatility is really high and there are a number of stocks with large price fluctuations. I want you to be careful. I got it. I'm no amateur. I said that while I chewed on some toast. I knew that Lisa was pulling back laughter while she held a coffee cup by the sink. Well, aren't you being cheeky was what she really wanted to say, I suppose. But Barton had called out to me, seeing my impressive trading skills. Even now, I was entrusted with many people's money and reaping large profits. Was thanks to have done his program, the basis for that program was based on my judgment. Thus, I didn't think it was a bluff. This was the foundation of confidence. Agana no longer sat at the other side of the table. She was now always sitting beside me as we ate. Seeing there next to me, Agana asked me a question. If you aren't an amateur, then what are you? Sarcasm? No, I didn't think so. I replied to the expressionless Agana. An investor. An investor. I don't intend to use the money I stole from my mother. I threw those words directly at Agana. It seemed that Agana remembered suddenly, and she looked like she was about to cry as she pulled back. But even then, Agana kept looking at me and repeated once more quietly. An investor. Yeah. Looking at the display, I said, We are investors. Next to me, Agana took a deep breath, which signaled that she understood. As she leaned against the sink, drinking coffee while she watched the exchange between Hagana and me, Lisa smiled without saying a single word and began to wash dishes. We, was what I said. There was no question who that other person was. We'll destroy Mr. Trosh. I said that as I glanced at Hagana. Hagana's eyes were unwavering as she nodded, like she was staring down a target in a mafia movie. 
With 500 million moles of funds in the virtual market, three times with the margin trading would be 1.5 billion moles. I was well aware of the fact that it would be impossible for this to be on the real market, to shift such a massive sum of money quickly. However, in the virtual setting, all participants were given 100 million moles to start with. Thanks to that, contestants could get totally immersed in large volume trading in a rough and tumble manner. If that became the case, then I would really be at an uncontested advantage. With my perspective on the program now changed, I feel like a fish released in water, able to swim around the market with total freedom. On top of that, the fund totals and rankings were updated every minute of every day, so I was thankful that I didn't have to be wary of high rollers like in a casino. It was completely possible in reality for a single person out there with a disgustingly large amount of money to mow down the competition. That was the true form of the demons who lurked in the first ten minutes of trading. Here and there I had seen some come together like piranhas ready to tear apart game, but in my opinion, what was anticipated was so clearly obvious that it would be difficult to derive any profit. Lure things in with bait, and when they come close, attack. With a gas program, I knew how much prices had to move before people using similar programs to trade would flock to the stock. Each transaction would yield 0.3 or 0.5%, which wasn't much in terms of profit. The time spent looking over at Agana's terminal was precious, and before long Agana started to read the stocks out loud. On top of that, Agana in her own way had a strong personality and did not know anything about taking it easy. As I listened to her raging words, I started trading like crazy so that even the time to breathe seemed precious. Naturally, it destroyed me. The fatigue was no different from torture. In the instant that the morning's train was completed, I looked straight up as if my computer gave me an electric shock. Taking a deep breath, I fell back against the chair without another thought. I couldn't move an inch. I couldn't utter a single word. Even with my eyes closed, the numbers swirled in my head. The necessity to do one thing or another caused a feeling of unease to swirl around in my mind. But it wasn't because I was not feeling well. Facing my objective, no matter what tools I used, it was clear what I had to do. After all, what I was doing was no different from what I was suffering before. In fact, the intensity was much higher. But I wasn't feeling bad about it. Furthermore, three days after we started concentrating on, concentrating on the investment contest, Agana brought me a damp towel warmed in the microwave since I was slumped on my back staring at the ceiling. I imagine Lisa had suggested she do that, but I was really happy that she did. Even though training was over, she had gotten up from her chair. She continued to sit next to me, tapping away at her terminal. Agana herself also needed rest, so she closed her eyes at times. It was very quiet, even though we only looked at each other when we talked, so now it felt very friendly. I knew that we were both running towards the same destination. Once the break was over, we needed to proceed with the afternoon training and then limp on until dinner, exhausted to the point of not being able to stand. At dinner, we could return to being human again, with Lisa providing some light banter while Havana stayed by my side, making improvements to her program. Our virtual funds were increasing in 10 million intervals. Unsurprisingly, Mr. Troche, who had an MBA from Harvard University, completely controlled the market. A week before we had to stop trading, he had amassed 360 million rules through his trades. While the increase in assets was rather shocking, I said to myself that it wasn't an impossible plateau to reach. But to close all positions with such precision was impressive to him, I thought. With the market this frantic, there was a chance prices would go up, but also a chance you'd lose your shirt off your back. Specifically, if you had Mr. Trosh's level of assets, there was a possibility you could get targeted with what trades you were making analyzed. There were already a number of people who had been targeted and fallen tremendously in the rankings. The secret to how that worked was, even for, was that even for people who had finished their trade but had unclosed positions, the amount of money that displayed to the rankings would change as the stocks moved every day. Where someone used a program like Kagano's, one could ferret out those stocks by looking at all the available stocks and computing possible candidates by comparing the price fluctuations in the market with the movement of the forces of the top rank participants. After that, all that would be necessary would be to join forces with others to do some reverse trading. We were staying in fourth place at 150 million moles, with this is second place being 100 million moles, and third place being about half that way. Technically, there was one week left, but there was a Sunday in between which made for six actual days of trading possible. With Sunday in the middle after trading on Monday and Tuesday, it would all end at 5 p.m. on Wednesday. Haga and I mustered all our available strength. 
But when a loss was taken due to carelessly not getting a warning from the program, I vowed to unlock and lash out with that foot of hers. You know, if she misread something about certain stops, I'd yell at her afterwards. Even then, things didn't turn gloomy. I knew that Lisa would become excited many times during all this, but it never made things worse. 30 million moles of profit on Thursday, 20 million moles on Friday put us at 200 million moles, passing the guy at third place by a narrow margin with only 40 million moles between us and second place. There was still the 160 million mole difference between us and Mr. Trosh. For Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we had to increase our total gain by 80% at all costs. We were trading completely with full leverage, so it was no different from having 600 million moles at our disposal. So all we had to do was achieve a real return of 27%. Returns of 10%, 10%, and 10% would be more than sufficient. Based on the performance on two Thursday and Friday, whether this was possible or not was unclear. Honestly, we were trading at an unprecedented level. We were pushing ourselves with all our might, and Agata was whittling down her sleeping hours. She'd camp out waiting for Lisa to go to bed, then sneak into my room where I'd be moving the program until the morning. There were times where she'd be sleeping like a log beside me. Also, she was a lot she was sleep deprived a lot more, and would drop her chopsticks or spoon more often during meals. We both knew that we were nearing our limits. However, Lisa wouldn't object. There was no room for her to do so. On Saturday at the end of our discussion, we thought about taking on more risk. Fiddling with the numbers on the program in order to select a number of stocks with large price fluctuations, we selected more speculative stocks. For the ones with large price fluctuations, many were selected through derivations based off mathematical principles that got utilized. It was an unattainable region, much like the concept Martin had spoke of, a region of extreme rises and falls where human sentiment could clearly be seen. In the midst of all this tension, Hagan and I began Saturday's trading. We felt strong progress as I was suddenly able to knock down with the feeling of tension from feeling the time crunch. I got it went so far as to borrow Lisa's terminal and asked Sir all to copy the program. During trading, the program's content was updated in real time. Doing all this while being sleep deprived and exhausted, we weren't looking so healthy. But even so, at the end of Saturday, when she saw that we had managed to hit 16 million rolls of profit, even Magana was all smiles. At the moment, we were in second place. Only two more times. If we could do that again two more times, we could defeat Mr. Trosh. That excitement blew away all that fatigue and sleep deprivation. We had set foot upon new territory. No, more accurately, it was Agata's program that led me right into the footsteps of a deeper place within me. But even then, I wasn't against the idea. If there was something I could give to Agata, I was determined to give her everything. An email from Barton arrived at my computer. Interesting, it said. Martin, who paid the sponsorship fee and could look at the trade history of all participants in the trading contest, could believe that we had gone a step further based on our trading history. Saturday night, that excitement was a helping hand as Sagana and I researched stocks and updated her program in my room till 3 in the morning. But no matter how much willpower is replenished, the body has its limits. Pathetically, I was the first to give in and I slept that day. Agana said she had more things to think about and got up. But given how often that has already happened thus far, I paid her no heed and continued to sleep. Light fell upon the desk as Agana tapped her terminal, but the call of sleep was enough that I paid absolutely no heed to this as I slipped back into unconsciousness. That was why when I awoke suddenly I thought it was strange. I figured I had neglected to go and use the toilet. But I realized that wasn't the case as I heard the sound of someone sleeping nearby. And it wasn't me. Huh? I wasn't sure whether I was half asleep or not. What I did know was that Hagana had gotten into my bed and was sleeping next to me. Or rather, I wasn't sure next to me was the right way of describing the situation. Hagana's hands were tucked close to her body as she slept like a baby in the fetal position. Her face was above my right shoulder. Her forehead was against my cheek. Her hand clutched my pajamas. The side of her foot was atop mine. Agana's body temperature was rather high, enough for me to wonder if she might have had a fever. No more so than it just being abnormal, her high body temperature is similar to that of an infant. That was why, I suppose. 
Though I suppose when I realized that she was sleeping next to me, I didn't think of anything beyond that. Besides, I wasn't exactly filled with guilt about it. I was more filled with the notion of hopefully not waking up Agana, as well as a sense of happiness. This was the first time I'd known how comfortable it was to be attached to someone like this. Before long, I succumbed to sleep, and morning had come. It's not like I had set an alarm, so it felt like I could just sleep forever, but I woke up at the usual 7am. Though I'd only slept three to four hours, today I woke up on the dot as usual. Immediately, I thought about Hagana. She really was still clinging on to me as she slept. Actually, we both woke up at the same time. So, I guess they just changed her face for this, or something? The awakened Hagana looked blankly as nothing in particular. She was basically slipping out of her half-asleep state, and I could see that she didn't know where she was. Perhaps due to fatigue and sleepiness, she had simply forgotten where her bedroom was. That's what I thought when Nagana closed her eyes and curled her body more. She then yawned loudly and looked at me, who was rather close to her. And with the usual intense look in her eyes, she spoke. Your snoring is loud. Anger and a strange kind of happiness were hanging dangerously over the room. The only reason an accident didn't occur was that Hagana quickly, or rather a bit too quickly, slipped out of bed. In the morning light, Hagana's beautiful hair fell smoothly along her back without a strand of bed hair. She murmured in a delightfully low voice as she stretched, and I could see the line of her body clearly as her pajamas rustled. Hagana's body heat lingered in the futon, as did her fragrance, which was clearly not from shampoo or body soap. Courtesy of the pheromone phenomenon called morning glory, I couldn't exactly get out of bed at this moment. point. I got to tap the terminal on desk to start it up, and she tapped and turned towards me with it in hand. How long do you intend to sleep? She said that with a disdainful look in her eyes. Even with her contempt, I couldn't really make excuses unless I replied. Give me five more minutes. I got to thought about it for a moment and nodded. I'll come and wake you up in five minutes. She walked briskly out of the room. Five minutes was more than enough to get prepared. Again, I spent that day in the living room entirely with Agana, devoting all her time to updating the program and analyzing stocks. It was around afternoon when we had someone stop by. I figured it would have been Chris or Toyama, but surprisingly it turned out to be Seralt. You haven't come at all lately, so I figured I'd stop by instead. I hadn't called for him, but I was thankful for the juice and snacks he brought. Lisa basically didn't buy that stuff, after all, and I was not used to buying it as it would be a waste. I took a can of dark carbonated soda, one of which was developed on Earth, and in one way or another, held near complete control of the market for 100 years, while Hagana drank 100% pure orange juice. So I want to say that there, this is supposed to be Coca-Cola, because that would be the, that's the older of the two. In order for Pepsi to have that, that'd be predicting the future, but Coke should have that in their past, I want to say. Both of them were imports, which compared to the synthetic stuff was several times more expensive. That was rather considered, Seralt, I thought. So, real quick... This is a PSP, I want to say? Yeah, it doesn't have the stick over here to be a Vita, it's gotta be a PSP. So, you two are looking awfully friendly with each other. He teased with those words as he put his hand around my shoulder and took a peek. The rustle of his hair was enough to start a on who was next to me. Sorrel, don't bother them. Before I could even complain about Lisa said it for me, Sorrel looked up and shrugged his shoulders. What, really? Really, really. I wasn't sure whether Lisa was copying me or Sorrel, but in either case, that was what she said. Still, it was without a doubt that it was for real. Hagana and I long ago surpassed the level of just playing around. Hey, Hagana, are there any bugs in the program? Sorrel continued his antics and said that to her. Hagana turned towards Sorrel in her chair and looked directly at him and spoke. No. Her response was enough to elicit a laugh at his expense, and Lisa smiled as she patted Sorrel on the shoulder and insulted him. As Hagana was in the midst of turning her back towards her terminal, she realized something, stopped, and then spoke. It's an impressive level of completeness, in my opinion. I looked 
looked up and turned around to see Sorrel staring blankly. Then, like a good responsible adult, he was smiling ear to ear. Next to him, Lisa had a gentle smile on her face as so kind of turned back to what she was working on. One way or another, everything was in front of us as we moved forward. Well, with that said, we'll begin out of your way then. Man, after taking the time to come by too. Oh my, are you saying that you weren't satisfied with my company? And that's what Seralt and Lisa talked about. Perhaps owing to the fact that they were around the same age, Lisa seemed to be speaking more frankly than usual. That's not it, but there isn't the excitement of getting to know someone for the first time, though. Oh my. Since when was our relationship like that? I looked up briefly and saw Lisa smile boldly with her arms folded. Sorrel saw this and put his hand around Lisa's shoulder. See, this kind of thing annoyed me. That's a harsh way to put it. Beaten down by the rain, did you not have an inclination offer a helping hand to save me? Is that not love, then? It is love, and in total seriousness, too. Those words startled me. Lisa was into Seralt. Speaking of which, Seralt had boasted before about sleeping on Lisa's lap. On top of that, seeing as this was the first time they got met, had met Seralt, it was highly possible that Lisa and Seralt had been alone together in the church before. An adult man and woman came to lay his head in her lap to boot. Honestly, that did agitate me a bit. Could be that Lisa and Seralt were... But Christ loves everyone equally. And just like that, Lisa ducked under Seralt's arm, and he did look disappointed that Lisa slipped from his grasp. Sorry, okay? You sneaky woman, you. The Lord will love you whether you act virtuously or otherwise, so you don't need to worry about it. I've fallen for a troublesome woman. Such a liar. As Lisa chuckled, Seralt scratched his large head. I wasn't sure if this was real or just some joke, but they did earnestly appear to be close. And while I looked at those two, I realized that something pointed was directed, directed at me from right next to me. Logano was scowling at me. What are you doing? There was very little time remaining for us. If we were to overtake Mr. Shosh in first place, our focus could not become fragmented. Gana's anger was rather considerable. I turned back to my computer and quickly resumed work. But somehow, Gana continued to look displeased, much more than usual. In the end, that day, Sorrel ate dinner with us. Sorrel talked a great deal, and Lisa seemed to have more fun than usual. Also, before he left, he stood in the church with Lisa, and they had an honest talk about the dead. Lisa laughed and evaded Sorrel's questions. Even for a joke that Sorrel liked Lisa, he was almost certainly another of Lisa's rescues. According to the policeman I overheard while I was escaping from a Chinese restaurant, Seralt had something of an amazing background. It was possible that Seralt succeeded in the highly competitive world of his new city and somehow fallen from grace. Besides, he didn't seem like a bad guy, and deep down appeared to be rather serious-minded. Maybe he had heard about Lisa's debt and wanted to help her as a way to pay her back. But I couldn't imagine that he would have deep pockets. Just listening to the conversation, I came to the conclusion that he did, in fact, live inside the Big Bull Cafe. Granted, Lisa didn't look like one. Lisa didn't look like one to do anything arbitrarily, so I was somewhat relieved. Why I was relieved, I wasn't sure, but in any case, I was relieved. I stopped stealing glances at them and went back to my room. In my room, Hagano was updating her program. When we got back in, we continued our banter back and forth, right where we left off. I wasn't sure if that forcefulness was more over the top than normal, or if it was just me overthinking. And then, on that day as well, Hagana and I slept together. She seemed to cling to me even more than she had the night before. Starting from the following Monday, there would be only three days left for trading. One hundred million moles left until we reach Mr. Troche. Profits per day of thirty million, thirty million, and forty million would be enough. It can be done. It will be done. With that enthusiasm, trading began. But as soon as Sagana and I began trading, we started to feel uncomfortable. An hour elapsed and it evidently became clear what was strange. After a few more hours when the root of the problem was discovered, it was certainly surprising. I can't calculate this with math. Sagana murmured, dumbfounded. After finishing my trades frantically, I felt exhausted too. 
We only manage profits of 10 million moles. With that, the hurdle is raised to 50 million and 50 million for tomorrow and the day after. To make things worse, at one point in the morning, I thought that victory was at hand, only to fall into despair now. The problem was very clear. The number of participants had dropped off significantly. All participants were given 40 days to conduct trades. And after the participants who were done leave one by one, new people would come in at the same time. However, there were only three days left in the contest, so a large number of people had already run out of time. Certainly, those numbers would gradually begin to decrease. However, considering that a large number of contest participants either had part-time work or were doing this at their own leisure, I had expected that many of them would be trading the days before and after the weekend before it all came to an end. If the number of participants decreased, then the flow of capital would decrease as well. There's no point in wanting to trade 100 million moles if no one could even match 80 million moles. Agan and I had managed to reach 260 million moles in funds, and with leverage at the lot time of trading, that would turn into 780 million moles usable. Today on Monday, the number of socks that we could throw these funds at had diminished. By Tuesday and Wednesday, it was already a certainty that the flow of capital would have dried up. This was bad. It became an exceptionally bad situation. What should we do? Agana asked me a question. I relayed to Agana what I was pondering and what I could think of. Thus, I was dead certain that as she spoke, she could guess my response to some degree. We have no choice but to throw funds into a large company. I wasn't sure whether or not mathematics could be applied to such a stock, though. Rather, there must be others who are thinking the exact same thing we were. So I can imagine that tomorrow, the day after, there would be a certain number of stocks that would be focused on, tra on for trading. Would mathematics be able to see through that? I looked at Agana, but her eyes showed uncertainty. Fewer stocks will make these statistics more unreliable. In that case, we'll just have to increase value within a safe limit. It was a rather simplistic conclusion, and thus we had no choice but to go along with this simple idea. We were like fish searching deeper and farther as the water dried up around us quickly. Thinking of that matter with Mr. Trosh having finished trading when he did, it was like he saw the situation we were in now. Genius. He was a genius. We managed to pull within 90 million moles of that genius. It was a dizzying pace to get to third place, and things, were together, things came together once we hit the 200 million moles. Time mercilessly continued to flow, and soon it was the start of Tuesday. I got a state up all night analyzing the trading date for Monday and updated the program to increase the range of available possibilities. I thought I'd give her a hand, but instead she said that she preferred that I got some sleep. Specifically, she said there would be no problem if she fell asleep, but all would be lost if I did. It was rather sound and thus hard to refute, and for a change, I slept before the day changed. Though I only slept with Agana twice, I found it surprising how cold it felt to sleep by myself. Then, when Tuesday's training ended, Agana and I did not exchange a single word. There was the possibility that we were simply tired, but the root of that silence was that things weren't as profitable as we thought. A gain of 22 million moles. We couldn't even hit our quota. That left us with 68 million moles to go. Participants dropped off more than on Monday, and the scramble for the last scraps of the pie was ferocious. In the middle of it all, Agana was on the verge of tears. Her program was completely off the mark. Somehow, we arrived at second place. Or rather, third place dropped off considerably, and second place was now a practical certainty. However, at this point, we'd only received 50,000 moles, once Lisa's loan was paid off, then that was that. I wonder if the reason I got did just say to quit at this point was because of that 50,000 moles felt more to her like a borrowed sum. And on that note, I had done any trade on the real market, so my funds hadn't increased at all since then. At this point, if I got over to trade by herself, by and large she'd be able to make money. Certainly, if I was out of the picture, I proportion of earnings would increase as well. If that were the case, 100,000 moles wouldn't be out of the question, would it? If I could, I wanted to leave her with as much to work with as possible by way of funds. 200,000 moles. I felt that it was the least that should be there, given how hard I've gotten and I'm working. After dinner, Hagan and I looked into the current possibilities. There were now only two choices available. One was to do what we did today. The other was to narrow things down to exactly one stock. 
A single stock is dangerous. I kind of said that suddenly. But it would be impossible if we went with more stocks. The amount of funds for trade was ridiculous, and though anything could be purchased, it opened up room for more mistakes. At this point, we were more like a prominent whale in a dried up pond. More like a beached whale, like out of a film, though. Unable to move due to such an enormous body, blowing out salt water in anguish. Once the purchase was made, the price would go up and all the others lying in waiting would sell at once, setting the profit amount. This would drop the price back down and we would have no one to sell our large amount of shares to. If we sell them off carelessly in the face of very few buy requests, the only thing left would be to throw on the towel. The price will go down and once slow enough, a sell-off will begin. Going in through margin selling, the same old thing will happen. In the end, the exact same thing will happen in reverse. In order to avoid that, we had to be able to move our huge body around. In other words, focus on a single stock and trade with full force. By grabbing and twisting up all that selling pressure, a higher price could be forced. If prices could be raised artificially while the last trades were made, then we'd win it all. I wasn't sure whether or not monsters lurked in the ten last ten minutes of the investment contest. If nothing else, with Mr. Trosh having already finished trading, right now, at this moment, we were the giants of the marketplace. I realized that, in order to win, all that could be done was to force prices up artificially and hold out till the end. Will everything be okay? That was all Magana could ask. We have no choice now. That was all I could respond with. The room fell quiet during the night and mere silence held complete control. Whether you laughed or cried, in less than 20 hours, victory or defeat would be decided. It doesn't seem like it can do much else now. Hagan Hagana suddenly said that. Huh? Hal's greatest strength is my greatest weakness, after all. For a time, all we literally did was eat and sleep together. At the very least, we were in agreement on that. Well, I suppose so. When I said that, Hagana looked downcast as she nodded. At least, it appeared that she was downcast. At the brink of victory or defeat, I came to the realization that my abilities were not enough. When I had first met Hagana, I figured without a doubt that that was the case. But things were different now. Everything was the reverse. Honestly, I felt a pain, as if a part of my body had been severed. It's too bad, though. That's what Hagana said. She then tapped her terminal, and with a particular beeping sound, the light went off. If Hagana were an android, it would be the perfect sound for her as if she had been deactivated. With the light off on the screen of the terminal, suddenly the room seemed barren. As if all that enthusiasm up till now was all a joke, that silence returned. Even after the power shut off on her terminal, Hagana did not get up from her, the chair. I understood Hagana's feelings to the point that it pained me to do so. To have gotten this far and not be able to keep going was indeed painful. Of course, she could watch over my shoulder. She could also try to offer some advice while running the program. However, the number of stocks under consideration was limited, and it was an undeniable fact that the more we had to rely on massive swings, the less useful Hagana's program would be. It was evident that as much as Hagana's program consumed me, the reverse could be said as well. It was really painful. Thus, it must have been painful for Hagana. Right now, looking at the side of her face as she appeared on the verge of crying, I wanted to say something. I tried desperately to make myself think. Was there not something, anything at all, that Hagana could do? I considered every possibility. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that I thought back on everything that I had talked to Hagana about. There must have been something. It's not possible that there isn't anything at all. Barton had said that excellent quads would turn everything about a traitor into numbers. If that was the case, then there had to be something. And then, Hagana sniffled and stood up from the chair. Good night. With her short utterance, she made for the door without even looking at me. Instead of her terminal, she had her folded up pajamas in her hand. I was surprised as I wondered when she had grabbed them. It's me my heart throb as I realized that she had intended on sleeping in here tonight. And so, in that brief moment, I grabbed her arm. 
It was a rather reflexive thing to do. Agata's wrist was slender and small, but the bone was firm, and there was a slight bit of flesh and soft skin upon it. I could feel her body temperature. Agata turned around and looked at me. Looking back at me, her eyes showed unfounded fears. If she'd been sold on Earth and having run away from home, perhaps this had happened before. I couldn't imagine that Hagana's parents were happy to sell her off. Certainly, when Hagana ran away from home, her hand was held just like this. However, that couldn't buy Hagana her freedom or stop her from being sold, I suppose. Powerless. Only holding powerlessly onto Hagana's hand. Perhaps for a brief moment, Hagana had hope. If that were the case, then I would have been at a loss to explain the despair in her eyes when she first turned them towards me. I gotta look downcast and try to shake my grip off. But I continued to hold on. I gotta try a second and third time to shake me off when she suddenly started to cry a bit. I didn't know what I should do. I knew that this was a bad situation, seeing an atrocity in today's society was enough to make me cry as well. I gotta use the side of her hand to try to loosen my hand. I applied force and could see Hagana's face show signs of discomfort. Hagana couldn't move. She could only give in to force. That's how it always was. Force. Movement. At those words, my mind wandered off briefly. Ah. It was a sensation as if my mind was being assaulted by messages from outer space. With a buzzing sound. Or rather, what I imagined it sounded like, the third eye in my mind opened. Hey. Let go. I gotta sobbed a little as she said that. Hey. Hey, are you listening? <laughs> ah, the tide has turned. Now, Hal is the one that's looking psycho. <laughs> But man, this part has had more unique CGs than I think any other part in the game. I don't know if we're actually approaching the end or not at this rate. With all my might, I pulled Agana to me. Agana's body was delicate and light. As soon as I pulled her close, she looked up from my chest. What are you doing? There is a way. Huh? There is a way. Your terminal. What? Your terminal. There's a way. There is something you can do. I said that to the teary, dark-eyed Agana, whom I still held in my grasp. I reached out towards the terminal I was about to fall from her hand. What? What can I do? There's trade volume that's sleeping. Sleeping? I got to repeat those words and open her eyes suddenly. But that path hasn't been... Exactly. There's the volume of all those who enter their train positions with fully leveraged on margin. Someone looked from the outside, wouldn't know how many were still alive. So there's always a chance that sellers and buyers could be off in their predictions. If the trade volume wasn't enough, then all you need to do is wake the sleepers up. For example, imagine a stock that was loaded with people who had bought tons on margin and ended their trading. The margin trade volume was always open to the public. Someone would know immediately who had been purchasing what. The problem was for sellers particularly those who hope to make a profit through price increases in what they purchase within margin buying. It isn't clear how much was still in play, and would turn with them to sell. If roughly all margin buys were out of commission, then the advantage would turn to us, the buyers. When prices go up, sellers would appear, and the short sales that worked would be taking their profit. But sales wouldn't come from people who were profiting with margin buy positions. When the pressure to sell weakens, those who are margin selling would get scared and pull out. And in doing so, buyers come out of the woodwork, leaving, having picked up the scent, creating an artificial price hike. If the margin buys were alive, and the price rises, then certainly they'll sell in order to take profits. With the market in an uproar, there would absolutely not be any level-headed individuals who could hold on to their paper gains and wait it out. Sell before taking a loss. Sell no matter what. In other words, if the price couldn't rise fast enough, then we would have failed. If within all that margin train we, only we knew who was alive or dead, we would gain an enormous advantage through the psychological battle waged. Even now, with the liquidity having dried up, this was the only way we could extract victory in this battle. 
and Hagana's abilities would be able to ferret out whether the margin buyers were alive or dead. We were aware of the ones ready to pounce on people who had already and in trading with open positions by making opposing trades. And riding on their actions, we can turn a profit. The relation between price fluctuation and ranking can be calculated with math. That kind of operation was Hagana's specialty. Hagana pushed away from me, then sat down in a chair and turned on her terminal. It looked as if her mind was already busy with calculations. Will this finish by morning? In my question, Hagana's hand stopped and she answered me promptly. This is simple. Those were heartening words. So go to sleep first. Hagana tapped her terminal with force as she said that. Staying next to her, all I could do was shrug my shoulders. No way I can sleep now. Hagana's hands had stopped for a moment, and then they resumed their work. Numerical values were input vigorously and computed as new formulas were written one after another into the program. Besides, you'll be done soon, right? I knew that she felt annoyed at my sarcastic words. But even then, it was a positive, gung-ho kind of feeling I got from her. Hagana was not someone to call on a bluff. It was then, perhaps after thirty minutes had elapsed. Finally, with the resounding tap, she looked up. Immediately after that, the CPU and HDD hard drive disk within her terminal started emitting a unique sound. There was a bar on the screen showing that calculations were in progress as the color of the bar filled from left to side to right. As the stock data was completely inserted and dissected, perhaps it was making sense of things. After many seconds of silence, a list of stocks appeared. Hagana then looked at me. Which looks good. My job had finally come to an end. It was written all over the satisfied expression on Hagana's face. By her side, I took a peek at Hagana's terminal, stretched out my hand, and tapped at the terminal screen. On the list, there was a surprising number of dead margin trades. In addition, ideally the ones that worked easily with our predictions would be best. I'd especially love it if people would jump on board automatically without a single thought. Those who'd surrender their thinking to machines were subhuman existences who had lost their privilege of being human. Barton's words came to mind suddenly. These were the appropriate ones to feed off, I suppose. This one. Putting faith in my trusty instincts, I selected the appropriate stock. Black Chocolate Incorporated. I think that sounded like some kind of sort of joke. It sounds tasty. Hagana said that spontaneously. You like chocolate? When I asked her, Hagana's face stiffened and she nodded. A little bit. What do you mean by a little bit? You should say whether you like it or not. A little bit. It can't be expressed mathematically. Hagana's words were enough to make me laugh. Hagana stood up and yawned loudly. I'm tired. It's your turn now, Hell. She wobbled and stood up while pointing at me. Get out of my way. Jeez, uh, hey, what are you... Huh? Hagana looked back at me. As if I was acting weird. Except, well, Hagana was staying next to my bed and had begun to take her clothes off. No matter how you looked at it, Hagana was the one acting weird. I'm tired, really. As she talked, I could see that she was drowsy. Above anything I was saying, she was focused on undoing the buttons of her shirt one by one. I couldn't stop her, so I did all I could to avert my gaze. Hagana put her pajamas on silently, and with a final soft yawn, she crawled into the bed. At that point, I thought I could stop looking away. I thought it would have been better if she went back to her room. On the other hand, I wasn't opposed to this either. Two people sleeping together was warmer than one sleeping alone. I imagine that Hagana thought that way, too, and there's no way she would have been unhappy about it. Move over a bit. A sigh was mixed in with my words. I lay down as well as I could on one corner to sleep. Hagana's back was to mine. As expected, it would be impossible for us to mutually to be this, mutually this close together when awake. Somehow, I couldn't fall asleep, probably because of that. Even though I was tired, I couldn't sleep. Even though I was sleepy, I couldn't sleep. It felt as though there was some obstruction that hadn't been overcome yet. Hell? In the middle of things, Hagana suddenly spoke. Huh? I responded in question, but Hagana did not reply. 
what is it? It seemed there was no response forthcoming. I was going to ask her once more, but I realized that she might have been talking in her sleep. That would be pretty embarrassing too, but she wasn't going to respond either way. I closed my eyes and made an effort to sleep. And it was at that moment that I heard her gonna again. Help? I didn't say anything as I looked over my shoulder. I kind of had her back to me so I couldn't see her face. But I was aware that she was awake. I have a question to ask you. And finally, she managed to say something. I turned back around and responded. What is it? Lagana became quiet again. However, I hadn't expected Lagana to turn her body toward me. Suddenly, I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and any sleepiness disappeared instantly. Lagana placed her forehead on the nape of my neck, which caused my body to freeze up completely. Will you answer my question? In that situation with that question, as a man, there was only one way I could answer. What is it? I gulped and continued. Is there something else you need to ask me about? What came to mind didn't amount to more than that, and anything else that I could think of I could not manage to say. Yet Hagana didn't acknowledge those words right away. I thought I would feel annoyed about her silence, but suddenly it occurred to me how stupid my response was. Tomorrow, what will happen if you don't win? I was so surprised that the words wouldn't come out. Hagana's words went through my back and pierced my heart. Tomorrow, what if I lost? With that, I now realize what was stuck on my mind. I don't understand the reason why you suddenly had an interest in the contest, Hal. Without understanding the assumptions, the conclusions can't be understood. I got up with those small hands of hers on my back. Her hands were unbelievably warm. If you lose, what will happen? It was just like Kagana did not ask about what I would do if I lost. If I lost, I would be sold and disappear. The way she asked seemed to call out for an answer like that. My heart was beating rapidly now. It seemed to become so loud that I was draining the possibility of Kagana hearing it. Perhaps she could hear it. For this long stretch of time, Kagana was cuddled up next to me. Whether we lose or win, the result won't change. Huh? There's something that I haven't said to you yet. Readying myself, I turned around in bed. Within the narrow confines of the futon, Hagana was in front of me. With one hand always across her chest, I could see that she looked cold. What? When the contest ends, I'll leave this place probably. She wore a puzzled look on her face. After staring at me for some time, she finally asked back. Eh? You see, someone invited me to join them. He's a pro investor. On top of that, an extremely good one. Hagana looked at me blankly. While she stared at me, only her lips moved coolly. And? My train technique and his methodology are very compatible with each other, so probably I will become his apprentice. There was no reason for me to say it outright. Without a doubt, things could become bad otherwise. Although Barton was rather busy, he took the time to follow our training record. Compatible? Yeah. More than me? I got almost straight to the point. I felt she might have been angry as well. No, I changed my mind on that. If I just made an excuse arbitrarily, then Hagana would be angry. Thinking back on it now, I realized that it was jealousy. More than me? Asking once more, I had no choice but to answer. The path you walk is different from mine. What do you mean? Depending on the answer, I'll strangle you to death. Hagana's intense eyes were ideal for times like these. Well, how should I put this? Don't you feel that you are merely compensating for what I'm lacking in? Her program was a clear indicator of that. As a human being at the limits of my abilities, I was being assisted by the power of technology. However, Hagana did not respond and her eyes urged me to continue. But the person who invited me on, he's someone who is far more amazing than I am. On top of that, he's far more skilled than things I'm aiming for. 
Based on numbers in the market, I could see through the perceptions of people to turn a profit. But Barton looked at things from a more fundamental level in order to understand people's thinkings. Stock was a necessity to move a corporation forward, and a corporation was a gathering of people. Thus, his trade technique was on a level two to three times above where I stood. So that is why I want to learn how to trade from him. Take me with you. That was Hagano's immediate reply. That rather surprised me. I never imagined that she would say something like that. I will be useful to you, Hal. Besides, there's also the issue of the debts of the people in this town. That won't work. That was what I said. And then I said it once more. That won't work at all. Hagano was not sad at all. Just that it was her usual expression while her lips stopped moving, as if she was about to say something before she pursed her lips tightly. With that expression, the only thing that betrayed any emotion was those lips. Those lips tightened. For the debts of the townspeople, with just a bit of time, you could take care of it. I can't. Of course you can. Don't lie. When I said that, she raised an eyebrow. Hagana was incapable of telling a lie. Why? Hagana asked me, but maybe she was more questioning whether it was because of her investing technique. I hesitated. Hagana asked once more. Why do you need to follow that man? Don't you already have all the money you need? I was taken by surprise by words that I didn't expect to hear. Of course Hagana was serious, and certainly that was the result of her understanding. Hagana looked at me, and even now looked like she was on the verge of crying. Or rather, because of the darkness, I wasn't really sure. But it's possible that she was already crying. The money isn't enough. It isn't enough at all. Then you can grow it. That was Hagana's response. From the nasal sound of her voice, I knew that she was crying. I was lost, and I hesitated before I clasped Hagana's hand. It isn't enough. Not at all. But... Ten million moles is not enough. What I want is ten billion moles, or maybe even one hundred billion moles. There were playthings for children of the sort. Paper money that had endless zeros written on them. One hundred billion moles was something like that to most people. But currently, the richest person in all mankind, the legendary trader called Mr. Infallible, had assets totaling 82 billion moles. So I want to say Mr. Infallible is actually supposed to be a reference to uh, Warren Buffett with Berkshire Hathaway. So, I don't really have time to explain how the whole insurance thing works for things that big. Just know that's a lot different from your typical insurance. And some trading is involved, don't worry. Thus, 100 billion moles was not an impossible number. Oh, one other thing. In case you're worried about the Mr. Infallible thing, if you're not aware, Buffett's nickname is the Oracle of Omaha. So, yeah. In Newton City, there's a road called Schrodinger Street. It's the focal point of financial alchemists who work in investment bank and fu hedge funds. It's where I must battle it out and win at all costs. For that, I must first train under the person who invited me on. I couldn't imagine that Tagana understood what I was talking about. Thus, when Nagata opened her mouth, the words that came out were not entirely unexpected. I don't understand. What will you do with all that money? This was Nagata who, who, when given 200 moles, would find no use for it. I wonder if she asked that question only because she didn't understand. I looked away from Nagata. As for that question on what I'd do with all that money, I had an answer. But I was scared. I was scared of being laughed at after talking about it. But Hagana looked at me intently. Those eyes, they were frantic. Lisa had said to me to not push Hagana aside. If I were to keep this to myself, then I would be pushing Hagana aside. Having said that, opening myself up was indeed scary. Yet I looked back at Hagana's eyes. Before Hagana had started trading using her software, she showed her courage while watching by my side as I traded. Seeing her absorb everything on the screen brought up a particular moment. During that time while she struggled, she continued to do her work as a teacher. At that time, Hagana said something to me. They also have dreams, she said. I have a dream. Hagana looked at me. And then she spoke.
what is it? Are you going to laugh? But even if it were pathetic to do so, I couldn't help but ask such a question. Hagana stared at me and after a while gave an honest answer. I don't know. A bit too honest. I was hoping that she would at least lie and say that she wouldn't laugh, but for Gana, if there was even the slightest chance of that happening, she wouldn't say it. But I want to hear it. Hagana said it clearly. She wasn't lying. She really did want to hear it. I took one step forward. If I were to have 100 billion moles, there is something I want to do. What? I was born on the moon. I somehow thought that she was going to say something suddenly, but Hagata did not respond. On that note, I continued. I'm different from those born on Earth. My birthplace was on the frontier of mankind's expansion. As always, Hagata continued to look intently at me. Though, I wonder if I've seen this expression in her eyes before. And so? So, there is no frontier for me. Fr Frontier. Have you seen the Sea of Tranquility Memorial Hall? It was a place to preserve the simple footprints of the first man to set foot on the moon. Nagata shook her head slowly. But I know about it. There, the footprints of the first person on the moon are there. You want that memorial hall for yourself? Without thinking, I laughed at Nagata's words. Nagata looked hurt by my action and glared at me quickly. Sorry, but that's not it. What's the point of buying the footprints? Well, then what? No, what I mean is that like those footprints, I want to set foot on undiscovered territory as well. A god who got angry at being laughed at continued to glare at me with those intense eyes, but she did not try to shake my hand off her. Undiscovered territory? Yeah, but... As Agano said that, she looked somewhat downcast. She was thinking about it. Where could such a place be? The moon's surface had been completely traversed, and underground excavation was already progressing. So this is a little bit impressive, because if you're not aware, the moon doesn't actually rotate. So at times, there you have a dark side of the moon where things get really, really cold. I'm, I'm doubting that they've actually explored while the dark side is there, but if they move carefully, I guess they actually could cover the entire surface of the moon. I don't know if there's a pole or anything that actually is kept in perpetual darkness. It's kind of interesting. But their technology has come a long way. Long before Earth's surface had been completely mapped by satellites, there was no mountain mankind hadn't set foot on and no seabed that hadn't been explored with observation vessels. I wasn't sure whether Hagana was thinking about human history or not, but after thinking for a while, she turned her focus back on me. I can't come up with a place such as that. I then responded proudly, Mars. Within my grasp, Hagana's arm stiffened. Perhaps she was taken by surprise there. So real quick, if you're not aware, there is a plan to send a expedition slash colonies slash something to Mars within the next 10 years. So, I don't remember when this game is set exactly, but that ship has sailed. <laughs> At this point, his best bet would be Jupiter, and that's assuming there is actually solid ground in Jupiter. The gas giants are kind of weird. Although Jupiter's moons are fair game. But Mars is... In the past, there was the Mars Immigration Project. With the orbital elevator, it was theoretically possible to reach Mars. But while the project was progressing, the moon declared itself to be an independent nation, and it supposedly became a political issue. A question like whether Mars should become an independent nation, and would that lead to the flames of interplanetary war in the future, should a planet become an independent nation? Besides, development on the lunar surface isn't over yet, so those plans ground to a halt. Hagana held her breath as I spoke. So if I could earn 100 billion moles, I wish to continue that project with my own money. And now I don't know how the mool compares to the dollar, but 100 billion moles actually is not a lot when you're talking about space travel. Uh, 
I forgot, like, the probes themselves cost the tens of billions. If you actually want to send people, you're probably gonna need at least a trillion to do stuff. <laughs> Unless you really do plan on being a very short one-way trip. I'm not very smart, so it isn't possible for me to attend Lunar City University, study space engineering, and become an astronaut. But as a sponsor, I can gather people with the power of money, and even aid in the construction of space vessels. A hundred billion moles is the kind of money that would be enough to manage a large country. Also, there is someone who reached 80 billion moles. It's not a pipe dream. It isn't a pipe dream at all. I held the guy's hand tightly as I spoke quietly yet passionately. Up until now, this was a dream that I had spoken to no one about. If it weren't for this darkness, I'm sure it would be obvious that I was blushing a great deal. But in the end, Hagana did not laugh. Instead, she said this to me. Do you really think you can do it? A realistic question. More than wanting to laugh, I felt my chest tighten. This question was enough to make me want to cry pathetically. That's not how it is, right? At some point, the hand I was holding Hagana's hand with ended up being held in hers instead. Keep going until it works, right? It is not that different. I had intended to say that, but honestly, I wasn't sure whether or not that would have been too dubious. That was how bewildered I was by Hagano's words. Amazing. I think it's an amazing dream. Hagano squeezed my hand in return, closed her eyes, and swayed back and forth gently as she spoke. She looked like a clumsy robot that wasn't capable of showing emotion in any other way. So, for your dream, it is necessary for you to win the contest? She asked me, and I couldn't hold Hagana's simple way of starting, stating things against her. Besides, at this point, I couldn't hide it any longer. No, that is a different matter. Different? Yeah, the contest isn't for my sake. I don't understand. Hagana replied honestly, and that honestly caused me some level of anguish. It's for your sake. Hagana looked at me. And? I said it before. The person who invited me on said that he could only take me. I won't be able to invest here anymore. That is why, well... As I hesitated, Hagana spoke. What? So I thought that you should have the funds to be able to continue to live with Lisa and be able to attend university. 200,000 moles should be enough, right? You won't lose her books four times, right? That last one was a joke. But it seemed that Hagana was actually angry as she kicked my foot under the covers. Ouch. Stop kicking. Stop kicking me. Idiot. Idiot. She said that as she kicked me. But it did dawn on me. Hagana wasn't angry at me because I was talking about ha her having lost that book. She was angry about something completely different. For my sake? Why? Hagana cried and closed her eyes tightly as she hung her head down in shame. I was confused as to what I should do. Immediately afterward, I got to let go of my hand and lashed out with all her energy. You idiot! I was falling to the ground along with the futon, and right when I was on the verge of doing so, my hand reached the floor. This time, I kind of was facing the other direction on the bed and was curled up in a ball. At that point, I decided to just leave her be, and I stood up after getting my feet off the bed. The futon was on the ground, so I could clearly see Hagana curled up in a ball. She was curled up like a newborn, but her hands were wrapped across her legs. Looking at her now, she seemed completely different from when she was in her room, so scared that she couldn't even recognize Lisa. Thinking about that, it might have been because of Hagana's face the moment she kicked me out. The moment I fell out of bed, I got a clear look at Hagana's face. Oops. This could probably be phrased better. She was apparently very embarrassed. Overwhelmed with happiness and embarrassed by it, it seemed. I hesitated for a moment, but at this rate, Hagana might catch a cold. But I also wanted to sleep in bed. After all, tomorrow was the last day of trading. In the end, I returned the futon to the bed and got back in. Hagana continued to stay curled up, facing the wall. I thought I'd look the other way as well, but I scolded myself for being too spineless. If you 
ask me whether this was a buy or a sell, I'd say it's a buy. 